Welcome to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. The PAS Report provides an honest analysis on the critical issues that matter to you without the biased media filters. Here's your host, Professor Nicholas Giordano. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. I'm glad you could join me. If you're not already a subscriber, welcome to the PAS Report and make sure to subscribe and follow this podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, share this episode with your family and friends and on social media because that's what has allowed the PAS Report to become a successful podcast because I have a great audience and you share the episodes and we talk about the issues that really matter. I mean, America is fundamentally changing before our eyes. Remember when a former president who promise the fundamental transformation of America. Well, that fundamental transformation is here. When it comes to politics, there is no shortage of topics. There's always something going on. But in today's day and age, it feels like so much is happening so quickly that it really is hard to cover everything. It's really difficult. We are living through a period that's going to usher in profound change. And as of now, none of that change actually looks like a good thing. It's hard to predict where it's all going to go, but the challenges we face are monumental. On one hand, you can argue that we've been headed towards this trajectory over a period of decades, that it took decades to get to this point. On the other hand, it seems like everything happened so rapidly that it makes it difficult to absorb the scope of what we are facing. However, one thing is certain. There is little doubt that we are on the potential verge of World War III, at the worst possible time with the worst possible person as the commander in chief. That, that, that much is clear. And what is so frustrating is that everything that we are witnessing today was largely avoidable. It's not like we are a victim of circumstances that were out of our control. It was always in our control. And that's what makes this so infuriating. We are witnessing a bunch of self-inflicted wounds by elitists that think they know better, that they're so smart that have these egos and arrogance about them. And their own hubris is what got us to this point. Look at every single metric, every single metric in the United States and around the world. We are far worse off today than we have been in a long period of time. And take any issue, right? So when it comes to our education system, it's completely collapsed. Students aren't learning. We're just cycling people through. They're graduating. They're not learning. The only thing that they're actually learning is they're being indoctrinated with anti-American beliefs, actually weakening our nation. When you look at our infrastructure, our infrastructure is falling apart. This is despite the $1 trillion plus infrastructure bill that this president pushed through. But it didn't really go towards infrastructure, now did it? When you look at inflation, inflation is rampant. Since Biden took off, his food and energy costs are up around 30%. And in some cases, actually higher than that, depending on the product. We are spending $1,000 more a month just to live the same lifestyle that we lived pre-Biden. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have an extra $1,000 a month. So like most Americans, like most American families and normal people out there, my family and I have had to make sacrifices. We've had to make cuts. It's amazing because I'm making more money than I ever did in my life, but I actually have less money than ever before, thanks to the Biden economy, thanks to Bidenomics. But we're told the economy is great. It's great that Bidenomics works and that we're just too dumb to realize it. We don't see the benefits. The peasant class doesn't see the benefits of what the president and his administration are doing for us. We're too dumb to realize it. Ignore the fact that credit card debt is at the highest levels ever, that the defaults are surging because people can't make minimum payments. We're also seeing mortgage defaults rising at a rapid clip. The commercial real estate market's on the verge of collapse. But you're supposed to pretend that your household finances don't really exist, that it's all great. And if an all-out war does happen to break out, they're going to say, well, energy prices, that's not our fault. Okay, understand, it will be a disaster. Then you have the open border situation. Again, preventable. Not that hard. Could have left in place the Trump policies. Not, Not difficult, but they had to do everything the opposite of them. This administration, a large part of the Democratic Party, they don't care. They don't want to close the border. They want the unending flow of people into the United States. Just think about what Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said. She said, we don't have a border problem, that we have a legalization problem. And if we just legalize everyone and grant everyone citizenship, the problem's solved. Amazing. Why do we elect some of the dumbest people into office? 
It truly is amazing. So listen up. This is really important. Uh, Bigotry requires disinformation. And it's not insulting enough to say that we have a legalization problem. It's not insulting enough to just let everyone come over and cross this border and do whatever the hell they want. If you look at my cesspool of a state, New York State, you have Governor Hochul and the Democrats just hammering out the New York State budget. It's going to allot $2 billion taxpayer dollars to house, feed, transport, and provide debit cards to migrants, to illegal immigrants, and health care as well. $2 billion. Now, New York State is a disaster. A disaster. We, the people of New York, are suffering in a lot of ways. We pay an extraordinary amount in taxes, especially when it comes down to property taxes. Now, if we took that $2 billion, how much would we be able to lower property taxes for ordinary middle-class homeowners? How much? Provide them with some relief. Again, when when you look at these people, it's as if those that do the right thing, those that play by the rules, those that follow the rules, they pay their taxes, they wake up each day, they go to work each day, they take care of their families. Those that do the right thing get punished, according to the Democrats. Yet, If you will break the laws, if you steal from stores, if you come to this country illegally, if you squat in people's homes and take it over, well, then they're going to protect you. That doesn't make any sense to me. But I'm a normal person that thinks in logical ways. These people are ideologues. That's all they are. And they're insulated from the problems that we face. That's why they're so out of touch. They don't care. It's the let them eat cake attitude. That's what we're witnessing on a grand scale. I mean, you have sections of Queens that have been taking no, taken over by illegal immigrants and organized theft rings. They steal things. Then they go on the streets on the weekend. They set up shop, taking over the whole sidewalk to sell the stuff that they stole. You have prostitutes walking up and down the street. The city's a disgrace. And every official should be ashamed of themselves. But they're not because it's about virtue signaling. You have people protesting protesting, chanting death to America, walking around with Hezbollah flags on the Brooklyn Bridge. What is going on? Not for nothing. But remember when Trump was first elected, the crazies went ballistic. They were warning that Trump's going to start a nuclear war, that the United States was going to collapse. It was going to be the end of the world. And then when President Biden was elected, these same folks, same people were claiming the adults are back in charge, that the world can now respect us again. And I want to talk about that this episode, because I think Looking at where we are and where we may be going, I I think it's critical. It gets frustrating because you see that authoritarianism is around the corner. You see the disaster that we're walking into, that this administration's walking us into. And unfortunately, our adversaries are taking advantage. So everyone, hang tight. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back, everyone. So before the break, I was talking about how they they warned us that Trump was going to destroy the United States, that Trump was going to lead us into a nuclear war. Now they're warning that if he is reelected, he's going to become a dictator. We're never, ever, ever going to have a presidential election again, that this will be the last presidential election in our history. These people are friggin' loons. They're insane. And they say that, you know, that, that Biden is back, that, that he brought the United States back, that the world can now respect us. But let's be honest, there is not a single foreign leader that respects or fears the current president of the United States. Not a single one. You have some of our European allies that may like this president more than they liked former President Trump. Okay, certainly there was a lot of disdain. They didn't like former President Trump. But let's be honest, they don't respect him. They know they could walk all over him. They know he'll do exactly what they say. And our adversaries, well, it's obvious. When it comes to our adversaries, we see how they feel, right? You have this administration that totally blew the Afghanistan withdrawal. And if you look at a post-Afghanistan world, it's been a lot more dangerous, has it not? Do you think that's a coincidence? The Afghanistan withdrawal will go down as the biggest foreign policy disaster in American history. And it was largely through incompetence, where we could have had an orderly withdrawal. We could have done the withdrawal instead of Kabul airport. We could have done it from Bagram Air Base that we spent how many hundreds of millions of dollars building up. If we did it through Bagram Air Base, it would have been secure. We could have got out all the Americans. We could have got out the Afghanis that supported us, that helped us over the years. More importantly, we could have stayed in Bagram Air Base. We still could have provided air support to the Afghan security forces to make sure that the Taliban wasn't able to recapture that country, especially as we were withdrawing. Now, I'm not advocating that we should have been in Afghanistan forever. 
But if we left a thousand soldiers at Bagram, they were safe. There wasn't going to be any real casualties. And we would have been able to make sure that the Afghan security forces can hold that country and the Afghan government can function. Instead, this administration decides to do everything backwards. The whole thing goes to hell. What do you think? Our adversaries didn't see that? Look at America as a paper tiger? That America and the American people no longer have the will? After 20 years of war, obviously we're not going to have the stomach to get in another war, and so the adversary is going to look to get more aggressive. They're going to view this administration as a failure, and that's exactly what happened. And so Russia decided to move on Ukraine. But again, it was preventable. If you've been listening to the PAS Report podcast, go back to March of 2021. In March of 2021, I warned about flashpoints around the world, and one of them was Russia. Now, international politics does not require that you, you become a physicist. You don't have to be a genius to figure this stuff out. Putin was amassing troops on the Ukrainian border. It's not cheap to move over 90,000 troops to a border. You got to feed them, you got to house them, you got to train them, and then you have to move the heavy and heavy military equipment. Again, not cheap to do. It's not like you can just slap up a tank onto a tow truck. It doesn't work that way. So it takes a lot of planning and a lot of money to be able to transport these things. Then you see Vladimir Putin conduct joint military exercises with Belarus. And when they finished the joint military exercises, it was weird because the troops left, but they left the equipment there. That doesn't happen. Normally, you take the equipment and bring it back to your military bases. Why would you leave the equipment on the northern border of Ukraine? And so it was obvious what Putin was looking to do. He was planning. And then six months later, he saw Afghanistan and the way we withdrew. Three months after that, in December of 2021, what was Biden's warning? Well, if he does a small incursion, if Putin does a small incursion into Ukraine, we'll have to talk about it. And then in February, obviously, Putin gave the green light. So the Ukrainian war was completely preventable, but this administration wanted it. And like I said last week, we could have pushed through a negotiated settlement that would have strengthened the United States, would have increased our power and influence. However, the Biden administration nixed it. They threatened Zelensky that if Zelensky puts his name, if he signs that deal, that he's going to get cut off and he'll never be defended by America, the United States, or any European country. So the egotistical, narcissistic, arrogant policymakers, they actually thought Ukraine could win. And it was a failure because now we see what's going on in Ukraine. Ukraine's being devastated. The lines are collapsing. And it's only a matter of time. But yet, we'll just keep pumping more taxpayer money into it. We're witnessing China become more aggressive. We're witnessing Brazil become more aggressive. Venezuela become more aggressive. North Korea become more aggressive. Do you think it's all by coincidence? Do you think this is all by accident? That they're just now saying, oh, let's become aggressive? Or do you think it's based on they see the weaknesses in our country? They see the weaknesses in the leadership. Just look at Iran. Iran sends 300 somewhat missiles towards Israel's way. Now, successfully and thankfully, the United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, a couple other countries, Britain, France, were able to shoot many of those missiles down, which is a good thing. We celebrate that. But here's the problem. You have this administration, the president himself, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, telling Iran, don't. Don't attack Israel. What is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. The Biden doctrine is don't. That's the Biden doctrine. And they all sing from the same page. So they all say don't. And what does Iran do the very next day? Well, they launch the attack. Truly stunning. Admiral Kirby is asked about this by Peter Ducey. And here's his response. Take a listen. Has President Biden considered maybe beefing up the public Iran posture to be more than just one word? You're, you're referring to don't. Yeah, and so let's talk about and they did it anyway and let's talk so about now, what we now the reason i stopped that clip is because admiral kirby goes on to give some meandering explanation about how we blew up 99 percent of the missiles that iran fired but that's not the point it's not the point that we've had the military success to blow those missiles out of the sky the point is that this administration from the president of the united states the secretary of state the secretary of defense and the national security advisor all came out and told Iran, don't, the new Biden doctrine. And Iran did it anyway. So it's clear. There is no respect and there is no fear. Because if Iran feared this administration, if they worried about what the American response was going to be, they wouldn't have done it. And why would Iran? 
worry about what the American response is going to be, because everything, everything that we've done since Biden has taken office shows that we will capitulate and bow to the mullahs of Iran. Just think about how this administration released billions of dollars to Iran without any real preconditions. Think about how this administration lifted sanctions off Iran. Think about a month ago when Iranian proxies attacked a U.S. base in Jordan and this administration threatened a response that never came. So why would Iranian officials fear us? Understand that when a president speaks, the world listens. And if a president does not follow through on his threats, that president is going to be abused in the international community. And that's exactly what's taking place right now. And then we have this bizarre thing going on in the United States where we're seeing these anti-American protests, where you're seeing hundreds to thousands of people go into the streets, blocking traffic, waving Hezbollah flags, screaming down with Israel, death to Israel, death to America. I mean, take a listen to this seminar that's going on. So I'm going to teach you a chant in Persian that you can use if you ever encounter those Zionist freaks, whether they be Iranian or whatever, all right? <laughs> now, I don't drink margaritas, but we all know what a margarita is. We all know what a bar is. So you're going to say, Marg Bar. Marg Bar. Marg Bar Israel. 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 Thank you. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, so it has, uh, it has two meanings depending on the <laughs> It can mean death to or down with. So, uh, can, we get, can we get a Mark Bar Amrita? We can get a Mark Bar Amrita. Yes, we can. Oh. Mark Bar Amrita! Mark Bar Amrita! Mark Bar Amrita! Mark Bar Amrita! Thank you. But remember, we can't say anything. Diversity is our strength. This is cultural enrichment at our finest. You have people that could chant death to Israel, death to America all day long here in the United States. And, and if you watch this video, you could go online, you could pull up clips of this video. It's truly amazing because you have a bunch of morons, mostly white idiots with their masks on that are suction to their face. You would think that we're back in 2020, but no, it's 2024. And they're all sitting there chanting the slogan death to Israel. Oh, then can we get a death to America too? This is the insanity that we're dealing with today. I mean, it, honestly, if you come into this country and you despise it that much that you're willing to say death to America, why the hell did you come to this country? Leave. Nobody's keeping you here. Get out. You don't have to stay here. Now, you do have the freedom of speech to say it, and I'll defend your right of freedom of speech because I do believe in our Constitution. But I could also say that if you despise this country this much, then get the hell out. Leave. Go somewhere else. And if you're an American citizen and, and you're chanting these things— well, guess what? You could leave too. Go anywhere around the world and you'll be begging to come back to the United States. You little self-entitled, spoiled brats out there. Because that's what you are. You have no clue how the world really operates. You have no clue the horrors that go around, on around the world day in, day out. And yet you want to sit there and say that America's the evil country, that America's a bad country, that America's inherently racist. You wouldn't be able to survive in another country. And what do you think is going to come next? Let's just say America does collapse. What do you think comes next? Because I could assure you it's not going to be better. I could assure you of that. And there are thousands of years of recorded history that would back me up on that. And yet, the lemmings in this country, they just go along with all this BS. Some just bury their heads in the sand and ignore it. They're probably happy people, though, so we have to give them that. Others actually support it and agree with it. Others are ind uh, indifferent to it. Well, how long do we survive as a nation if that's the attitude we're going to have? I mean, do you not recognize that those between the ages of 18 to 29 years old, only 23% of them believe that patriotism is an important concept? Only 24% of them are proud of their nation? Do you not realize how dangerous that is going into the future? I mean, the, the, these people, the 18 to 29-year-olds, they're going to be the policymakers soon. They're going to be the ones that are in charge of this country. Do you know how terrifying that is once they do take the reins and what they may do when they take the reins? But let's keep ignoring these problems. Let's keep talking about mean tweets. Let's keep voting on personality. The world is a powder keg about to explode. We're going to have World War III, but abortion is going to be the biggest issue because that makes a lot of sense, right? Like you do realize that if Israel and Iran go to war with each other, the Persian Gulf gets shut down. You're not transporting oil in the middle of a war. 
and the Iranian Navy is going to try and shut the Straits of Hormuz. If Iran did that successfully, that's 30% of the world's oil supply off the markets almost immediately. That means that gas prices are going up to seven, eight dollars a gallon relatively quickly within a week. That's a collapse of the global economy. So the United States will have no choice but to get involved in this war because we have to keep the Straits of Hormuz open. We have to keep the Persian Gulf open. We have no choice. Now, if we had a president with some cojones, if we had a president that would actually put the fear of God in Iran and the mullahs, telling the mullahs that if they even attempt anything, that they're not going to survive, that the Ayatollah will not survive, that their entire government structure will be destroyed, it will be obliterated. If we had a president that sent that message loud and clear to Iran, Iran would learn to keep their mouth shut and back down, the Iranian government. Everything in Iran actually favors the United States. Two-thirds of the population are of the younger generation. They don't like the Ayatollah. They don't like the supreme leader. They don't like the mullahs. They want closer ties with the Western world. People's economies are suffering in Iran. The people are suffering. They're dissatisfied. And yet, this administration emboldens and strengthens that government because they are incompetent. That's why. And it's because what would they rather do? Who do they view as a bigger threat? You know, I I wish someone from the press would ask a question that I want to ask, but I'm going to do it when we get back from this quick break. So everyone, hang tight. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. So if we actually had a press, if we had a press that would actually ask interesting questions, I want someone to pose this question to the White House, the White House staff, to Biden, President Biden himself. I would love to. Who do they view as a bigger threat? Former President Trump, the Ayatollah of Iran, Vladimir Putin, or Xi Jinping? I really wish someone would ask, because I would love to get these people on record. And and you know that they're going to try and do some type of equivocation between all four of the people I just mentioned. They're going to try and do it. And we see it. Despite all the fires that we have, this administration has chose to prioritize the targeting of political opponents. I played the clips of death to America, death to Israel. But what does the FBI want to target? Well, apparently praying the rosary if you're a traditional Catholic, you pose a bigger threat. You're a domestic terrorist and they must infiltrate the churches to get these domestic terrorists. But if you chant death to Israel, death to America, that's okay. It's stunning. You see where their priorities are. Parents that complain at school boards. Parents that want to see pornographic books removed from school libraries. Not banned books. Okay, they're not talking about banning these books. They just want to removed from school libraries. They're inappropriate for kids in elementary school, middle school, and even high school. Those are the those parents are the bigger problem in society. That's what they make it out to be. And we see this, right? But it's seeping into the young minds. That's why on TikTok you get people that start praising Bin Laden and saying Bin Laden was right and that America is really a horrible place. At every, every chance, these individuals constantly bash the United States every which way they can. I mean, even down when this administration first came into office and Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan sat down with their Chinese counterparts, trying to lambast us about racism and our human rights record. And you have Sullivan and Blinken sitting there like, yeah, well, we do have our problems. No, I would have stood up and said, you don't get to dictate to us about human rights. You don't get to lecture us about racism. Stop your genocide of the Uyghurs. Stop putting them in labor and death camps. Stop keeping your people hostage and open your country up. Let your people go. Let them be free. But no, we don't have leaders like that anymore. We have moral cowards. They're virtue signalers. They want to pat themselves on the back and they look at as America is actually the problem, not the solution. See, I, I don't mind any criticism of government. I do it each and every week, day in, day out. It's my job to be critical of the government. That's the difference, though, between me and them. They criticize America. They criticize the idea, the intent behind America and our founding. They want to see it destroyed. I want to see our government restrained and limited. They want government to destroy the idea of America. That's the difference. And they're willing to target political opponents to do just that. You have the New York City Trump trial beginning. You have the jury selection process. The the cards are stacked against Trump. I mean, let's be honest here. You have a prosecutor that campaigned on taking down the former president You have a judge who is a staunch Democrat, has donated to Democrat political candidates, including President Joe Biden. His daughter fundraises 
for Democrats, raising millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for Democrat and Democrat candidates, including the weasel, the imbecile, Congressman Adam Schiff, including Vice President Kamala Harris. As a matter of fact, she sent out campaign fundraising material about putting Trump in jail. Totally inappropriate, given her father is the judge in Trump's trial, in the New York City trial. But nobody cares. You have the judge threatening to throw Trump in contempt. Trump can't say anything about some of the witnesses like Michael Cohen, but Michael Cohen could go out there each and every day in the media and bash and berate Trump, but Trump can't respond. Now they're saying that Trump can't even go to Barron's graduation. I mean, if you really want to talk about petty, that's petty. And they're looking to weaponize the whole system. Why? Well, they certainly want a conviction, right? That would be great for them. They could say that Trump is a convicted felon, that he's going to prison. But it's not just about the conviction that they want to do. It's about tying him up in the courtroom, making sure he can't go out there and campaign, making sure that that he's limited in what he could do, making sure that he's spending money on lawyers, but more importantly, trying to demoralize all those people that support Trump. Now, everyone can make up their own mind of who they want to be the next president, whether it's Biden, whether it's Trump, whether it's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. That's up to the people. But see... The, the ones that scream threats to democracy, they don't want to leave it up to the people because they don't trust the people. They believe that they are the guardians of the system. They believe that they get to dictate, not you, that you don't have to say. See, they look at it in 2016 as the American people made a mistake by selecting Trump in the first place, and therefore it's their job to correct that mistake. These are the totalitarians that are in office now. And it's not just this president. This president doesn't even know where he is half the time. Let's be honest about that. It's the bureaucracy. It's the rot within our government itself that they no longer understand what public service is and they believe that they get to rule over us. But that's not the way the system is supposed to be. Unfortunately, we don't have enough people standing up for America. We don't have enough people standing up for the United States, even though the vast majority would actually agree with everything that I'm saying today. So many of them remain silent. They remain quiet. They don't like talking politics they, because they don't want to get into arguments. And you don't have to get into arguments. I don't understand that. Like you could have normal conversations with normal people. If you're going against a rabid leftist, yeah, just walk away from them. There's no point in talking to those people. You're not going to change their mind. But if you're just speaking to someone, ask them, are you satisfied with the current direction of the country? Are you satisfied with the current direction of New York State? Are you satisfied with the current education system? Are you satisfied with our roadways? Are you satisfied with the economy? Just ask them those questions. Because I could assure you, regardless if they have a D after their name or an R after their name, if it's someone that has two brain cells, they're going to say, no, they're not really satisfied with the way everything is right now. And that's where you begin planting seeds. Don't start dictating to people, yeah, that's not going to work. Don't sit there and tell them they're dumb because they're not going to listen to anything after that. But we can talk to people and we can persuade people. More importantly, we could get people that haven't been involved in the system in quite a long time to get out there and vote because that will be the biggest change that anyone could imagine. The millions upon millions of voters, eligible voters, who haven't voted in years. As people's livelihoods suffer more, more and more people will wake up. And that's the good news. While I'm very pessimistic on the current state of America, I am optimistic that we could see change sooner rather than later. And it's not going to be easy. I acknowledge that. And we're not going to be able to change things overnight for the better. But I do believe that if we're smart, if we pay attention, if we get involved, I do believe that as long as it took us to get into this position, we can reverse it. It is reversible as of now, but that's not going to last forever. And this next election cycle may be the most pinnacle election of American history. With that, if you found the content of this podcast informative, please leave the PAS Report a five-star rating, take 30 seconds to write a review, and share this episode with your family and friends and on social media. I got a great guest coming on Monday's podcast episode, so you're going to make sure that you want to tune in. I want to thank you for joining me, and I'll be back next week with another great episode of the PAS Report podcast. Thank you for listening to the PAS Report Weekly Roundup Podcast. Podcast. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe to the podcast so you'll never miss an episode. Also, visit PASReport.com and follow us on Twitter at PASReport.